us today. Um, my name is Erin. I'm a teacher in the nursery level. I'm not presenting today, but what I will be doing is um, viewing the waiting room and the and the chat um, as well. So as this, can, uh, just for time, just as this discussion goes on, if you have any questions that pop up, feel free to throw them into the chat. And at the end of the presentation, if it's not covered, we'll go ahead and we'll um, open up the, the floor. We'll unmute everyone. We could take our videos. Uh, back on screen and we can just have discussions about issues like specific issues that uh, you want to know more about. So great. I think we'll go ahead and get started. What I'm going to do is share my screen. And as I'm doing that, I'm going to let um, the presenters today from our pre-primary and our nursery level or in our infant level um, introduce themselves. I'll hand it over to Miss Carol Cozy in the Mars room. Thank you, Ms. Erin. So as Ms. Erin said, my name is Carol Cozy. I have been at MAG. This is my fifth year there, and I am the lead teacher in the Mars classroom, um, which is a pre-primary classroom, and children are two to three years old. Um, I've been in Montessori for about 15 years or so, and I'm super excited that you are here tonight to join us. And uh, Ms. Vivian? Hi everyone, I am Miss Vivian. This will make my 10th year at MAC, my fifth year in a lead teacher capacity. I spent most of my time in a toddler classroom, but about three years in the infant program. I'm in a Neptune classroom co-leading with Ms. Dolores, and I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Christina. Hi, I'm Ms. Christina. I am interning under Ms. Kell right now. I've been at MAC for maybe three years now. Thank you. Thank you. So um, we're going to go ahead and stop our videos just in an effort to focus on the presentation. Um, so basically, um, tonight's uh, session is really designed to be a session that is practical and uh, so that you can walk away with ideas, uh, very clear ideas on the things that you can do at home to adapt your home environment so that it, it's um, it's conducive to independence for your child. Uh, why, why do we want to do this? Just because children really thrive on structure and consistency and the more consistent consistence that um, exists between both environments, the easier it's going to be for your child to, um, to function. So Miss um, Erin, uh, can we go to the next slide? Perfect. So before we kind of dive into each section of the home, uh, we want to talk about kind of briefly, these are sort of self-explanatory, but talk about some of the Montessori guiding principles. These are the principles, uh, some of the principles that, that we use as a lens to uh, engage with the children based, you know, based our interactions kind of on these principles and also to um, set up our, our classroom environment. So we, we think it's very valuable to go over these before um, we dive into each section of the house so that no matter which section of your house you're thinking, you can see, you can kind of see through um, these, these principles. So the, the, favorite, the first principle we're going to talk about, uh, which you hear a lot about in Montessori, is it's an environment that is clean, that is beautiful, that is natural, uh, and that is organized. So basically a space that is decluttered with some elements of nature included as possible, for example, as much as you can, uh, natural light to, you know, open your windows or if you, not your windows, um, your, your shades or your curtains as much as you can when your children are around. Uh, wooden furniture is, is always a way to Kind of tie the, the outdoor environment in plants, flowers, and then we, we kind of have the beauty now of having command strips, which are super practical. I know we use them a lot in the classroom, and they're really helpful because they can help you place things um, in, a, in a sort of temporary, but yet, uh, uh, what should I say, a secure fashion. So um, you, can, you can even... Uh, use some command strips to put pictures at your child's level. So we know that they see the world at a different height than we do. So this is very important. And 
this kind of ties in with the next uh, principle, which is child's level. So obviously in our classroom, everything is set up uh, for them and, you know, it, all the tables, all the chairs, everything is looked at uh, from their point of view. At home, you can't completely repl replicate this because you also live there, right? And you're a, you're a grown person. Uh, but we can certainly make some adjustments at home to facilitate the child's experience. For example, providing tools, uh, little chairs, little tables, whenever and as possible. Uh, the child size furniture, you'd wanna be something that your child can manage without help. Uh, because we, again, we want to foster that independence that you are going to be hearing about tonight. And I'm sure you've been hearing since you joined Mac. Um, for, a, for a child size table and chair, it's ideal that your child's feet are touching the floor so that they have a proper position. Um, the, next, the next one is limited choices. So basically is less is more it's best to have a, a, a handful of materials or that's materials is what we call them in the classroom or toys, how you would call them at home, but it's best to have fewer uh, toys or materials of better quality rather than, uh, than having a lot of things that are not necessarily of good quality. And especially when just much like us adults, when the children are overwhelmed with um, a lot of choices, it's really hard for them to, to figure out and focus on one given thing. So you wanna make sure that you kind of curate those, those choices for your child based on their level of interest and their skill. Um, the next one is um, scaffolding and conversation. And so when we think about the child's environment, we think about us being part of the environment and one of our roles is to, is to help the children uh, systematically and progressively learn about the world based on, on the place where they are. We often say something like, we meet the, ch the child where they are. And so your job is to basically modify strategies to help your child learn and get acquainted in the home environment with you know, everything progressively based on the progress that they make and the place where they are. And obviously for that uh, conversation is super important. We talk a lot about broadcast, broadcasting and how uh, sort of narrating what you're doing really is helpful to the child to understand what the expectation is, what they're supposed to be doing and to really grasp what, um, what kind of uh, what we're doing at any given moment. We have to remember that the, the age group that we're talking about tonight are really young children that are just kind of discovering the world. Um, the next one is vocabulary. So basically just thinking about, um, thinking about, we, we often in the classroom think about objects of interest. So play, think about the artwork that you have at home, some of the decorations, the books that your child may have available. Uh, anything that basically can trigger a conversation and, uh, and catch your, your child's interest is something that we use to develop uh, vocabulary in the classroom. And that, that extends to every area uh, of the house from what you're cooking in the kitchen to what things are called in the laundry room. Um, the next one is, is kind of a big one and I know Time is, is sort of a luxury in these days that we live in, but as much as possible, the idea is to give your child time to explore and complete, complete different activities. And we want to remember that young children, very, very, very different than we are, they are naturally interested in the process rather than the product. And so that's why for them time is so important. And I know so many times, you know, if we're in a rush and we have to do things, we always are thinking about the next thing that we have to complete. But as much as you can, try to give your child uh, time to, this is how children develop uh, concentration and, and focus and engagement when they really have time to immerse themselves in an activity that they find 
uh, challenging and engaging and soothing. Um, the next one is kind of one that we all know about, but basically an environment that, that is um, conducive to independence. So when things are set up, considering the child's um, skills and also their age, and they actually have access to, to them, they can more quickly progress in their level of independence. Um, and the last two are also tied together, basically basically parameters and boundaries and freedom, freedom within limits. So as a parent and as a teacher, this is what we do in the classroom. We establish clear boundaries on what is appropriate and expected for the child, again, based on their age and, the, and their skill level and where they are. And what is key is that we have to be consistent and, and follow through. So a lot of people have this misconception that Montessori is about um, letting children be free and do whatever they want, which could not be farther from the truth. I think what we do really well is that we set up an environment in which the child can freely move because most of everything that is there is available to them and in the in, and can be used properly uh, because it's it's set up to to be that way. For example, just to give a little example, if I don't think two-year-olds should be using you know a lot of crayons at a time instead of putting a lot of crayons out at a time, uh, I just put two or three or whatever I think is appropriate you know at that given time instead of putting out a lot of crayons and then. Um, saying, well, no, you can't have six or seven. You can only have three of those. And so that's kind of how, how we think about it. The, the more stru structured the environment is, at the same time, the child has freedom to move and choose activities, but there are limits. And so if we are clear and consistent um, about it, the children are just marvelous creatures. They really understand that quickly and they, they know what is expected of them. We know that the parent-child relationship is different than the teacher-child relationship, but we also know that as much as you are able to do that, uh, your children really will, will understand and, and kind of follow along. Uh, there's something that I should say before we go into each area of the home, and we, we want to be clear that we don't want you to think that you have to spend a lot of money to make any of these um, changes. You can, you know, you can just utilize what you have at home. Maybe you have to make a small investment on a, on a low shelf and those are available, you know, very reasonably priced everywhere. But the key is, on, is to think about how you, how you lay out the space and, and the furniture that you may already have at home for your child how you make it accessible for them and kind of, like I just said a minute ago, how kind of you control the quantity or the amount of things that you put out for your child to use. So we don't want you to get overwhelmed thinking now like, oh my goodness, I'm going to have to set up a, a Montessori classroom in my home because that's obviously not the purpose. But uh, but just kind of think on different ways that these, these, um, these um, principles can be incorporated at home. Um, Ms. Erin, can we go to the next slide? Yes, just a moment. <laughs> there we go. So the first area that we're going to talk about tonight is the entrance. And um, this is actually the, the, a little snap of my classroom right now. And at home, you can have a small chair, a stool, or a little bench where the child can sit down, excuse me, sit down and take off or put on their shoes. Um, a low hook for their coat or their backpack. And I think you can see it in the picture that <clears throat> it's a command hook here. So that's super easy to install and to remove. If you know how to remove it carefully, you won't damage your wall. And they make them of very different uh, sizes and weights. So, you know, you can find three pound ones and five pound ones and whatnot. I'm sure you know all of that, but just, you know, just to point it out. And then um, you can't see it here, but what it's ideal for you to have at home is a basket, uh, 
for the small items that that your child may have it may be hat or mittens or sunglasses any seasonal items that that you think uh can be housed in this basket and that your child can have access to them should go there now if you have more than one child we we tend to recommend that you have a basket for each child that way things are kept organized and each child will, will quickly learn to know where to go to find their things um, next slide please and then we move to the living room um, this is a picture of the mars classroom when it was set up for for infants um, and here we can see how um, there is a there's a, there's a mat on the floor and you, at home you can have kind of a mat like this um, or a little blanket for that, you know, tummy time that is so important for the babies to work on. Uh, it's, really, it's really ideal that you have a space set up within your living room for your child if you tend to spend a lot of time in there. Hopefully you're able to, you know, have, have that space set up so that you not like you can be away from the baby for, for too long anyway so so here's um here we in this one we don't have a low shelf in this picture but if you can one simple low shelf that your child that is crawling or footing can get to with um with baskets uh with rattles and balls and we're gonna see some of those in the next slide um an acrylic mirror is kind of the safest way to go about it and those are reasonably priced as well these days um so basically a, um, a little space for your baby to hang out within the space that you hang out and we we like to say also that when we talk about pictures we often mean realistic pictures it's really it's much easier for uh, a developing child especially a baby to tell you know, the features in, in like, I, I, here when this video was in the classroom, you can see above the mirror some pictures of faces of, of kids expressing different uh, emotions almost. And that's a lot easier and more natural for a baby to recognize than, uh, you know, cartoonish like pictures that they just don't know that much about the world yet to be able to tell that. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? And here are just some ideas of activities that are available um, in the classroom. So you can see here uh, some books, mobile, balls of different kinds of texture, rattles, especially wooden rattles that you, know, you have to really make sure that everything that you put there is safe so that your child um, we know that they're learning about the world the world through their mouth so we know that everything is going to go um, in their mouth and then we move on to to those older infants that are ready for some kind of big size knob puzzles or logs and latches so that's what i was talking a minute about a minute ago when i said that that a simple shelf would be really useful uh, because it can house these kinds of um, activities. And then something that, that you're probably going to be hearing a little bit about is these activities are not, are not static. You know, the child kind of masters, um, produces interest in something. And then what you do is you remove, that's why this, this kind of setup, it encourages, encourages you to really observe and figure out what your child is into. You will simply remove what they have lost interest in and replace it with something that you think would be more age appropriate or challenging, you know, for, for where they are developmentally. Next slide, please. Um, and then the living room for the 18 to 36 month old. And here we have just one, a picture of one of our classroom shelves. Again, for you at home doesn't have to be this pretty and this sturdy it can just be whatever you have or whatever you can get your hands on um but we really do seriously encourage you to have a shelf for them uh, at home if you're here tonight it's because your child is at max so they're sort of already used to this having an open shelf really allows the child to see um the activities and kind of be cold to them make you know activities that are attracted to attracted to them 
and they can quickly figure out where everything belongs. Uh, it's definitely the preferred um, option versus a toy box. A toy box is a place where things get dumped in and no one can see, you know, you know children won't even remember that they have A, B, or C uh, toy available to play with. And, and it, it really is not conducive to order and independence. So there's a place to have a, a shelf definitely beginning at, at this age. Um, toddlers have such a strong sense of order. And so you will figure out that once things are set up and they're always in the same place, they will tend to put a bag uh, right in that spot. Uh, a table and chairs or even a small work rock that define their, the child's workspace, very much like we do in the classroom, they, they very quickly understand that concept. And then, you know, a place for everything and everything in its place. The materials are rotated by the child's interest and ability once again. And they, um, they can manage these kinds of activities better. You can see it here in the picture when they're set up in, in little baskets. So especially when they have, you know, different pieces to them, whether it's fossils or different kinds of blocks, basket, or, or even some trays, you know, do wonder to, to meet that need. Um, next slide, please. And then these are some of the activities that are available in, available in, in our classroom right now. And you can see, you know, different puzzles, uh, beading activities. So we have some practical life like washing the baby and matching and arranging flowers, um, blocks. But basically, you're going to use what you have at home. And the key is to make sure that they're sort of properly put together, that you don't have an excess of activities or an excess of pieces within an activity. Um, just so think about what's appropriate for your child's age. And depending on the size of your shelf, you can put, you know, two or three activities per, per tier and only a handful of them uh, on each shelf. It, once again, activities should be beautiful. I don't want to keep um, talking about that because I think we, we all understand that if something's not beautiful, it's not going to call to your child's um, interest. And the majority of toys or, or materials or activities that you're going to have at home, the key is for you to have them stored in somewhere. What you, you know, each, we each have different kind of layouts and setups in our homes, but you, know, you have a closet, you have some coats. Um, is there, and we can actually go to the next slide because I can point something out. And you can see how this family, they have the cubes on top um, there and most of the toys are, are there. And you can see the, uh, at the bottom, they have some open shelving available for the kids. And what they do is just basically they pull out from the bottom and, and, uh, and then bring down whatever they have on top that they think is, is fitting for uh, the child as they continue to move and progress developmentally. If you have multiple children, then the goal is to put the less complex complex activities uh, geared to that younger child towards uh, at the bottom, and then obviously the more complex one for the older child um, higher on the shelf. And then uh, if you have, and then last, the last part that I'm going to share with you tonight is the play area, which is, you know, what I said about the living room and the activities is all applicable to here. If you have kind of the, the luxury to have a, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, uh, an additional play area, not within your living space, then you really have the the possibility to almost turn it into um, a little Montessori classroom, if you will. Uh, and, you know, again, table, chairs, shelves, and different kinds of activities. I think you'll be, you'll be more comfortable um, with some art supplies and, and games and things where, you know, even some, maybe some kinds of sensory activities where things can get a little bit uh, or slightly messier, but not too much. Um, it's, it's really key here for you to figure out a basket for, for your child completed, your child's completed artwork 
so that you know everything can kind of be contained. If you have an easel, you can see in the back, this family has like a little freaking kitchen. I know Montessori is a lot about reality, but we also know that lots of kids have you know, these kinds of uh, toys at home. So this would be the perfect place to, to house that. And, and that's, you know, that's completely valid for that to encourage, you know, uh, the development of, of um, dramatic play and, and, and all that portion of the cognitive development. But, you know, maybe again, you don't want to put every single accessory and toy that came with a little kitchen. You may want to, you know, reduce and then rotate. Um, and then the last thing that, that we want you to always remember, you are the one to set up what the expectation is and how you think it's appropriate, appropriate to use the space. If you show them how to care for the space and how to put things away, they, do, they will do that just kind of how they do it in the classroom. Um, so I, yeah, again, kind of quantity, size, and if you regulate that, you're already, you know, 50% there. Um, next slide, please. And I'll turn it over to Ms. Vivian. Okay, so as we go into this next section, I just want to once again place emphasis on how we're helping the children to be independent. And the kitchen area, the areas that follow, it's no different. We know at home, um, sometimes it can feel a little different, a little rushed, especially when you're coming from work or you're at work while you're at home and you're trying to transition from one part of the day to the next. But creating that space to bond and give chances for independence for the child is so, is so important. And the kitchen is a great place to do that. So we'll start with um, allowing them to have access to the cupboard for snacks, plates, and cups. And I know for a lot of parents, you know, it's, you know, you can't even imagine having, you know, your child at this age, at the younger ages, go and get their own things. But um, as Ms. Carroll has been stating, they're more than capable of doing this. Our younger friends, our infants, not quite yet, but they're moving towards that place. So you wanna make sure, as you see in the picture, that you create a space where they can go and get their own things. Now, the thing is you have to make sure that you have control of error. So you control the amount of snacks you have set aside from them. They're prepared. They're prepared so that when they go in, you don't have to worry about them getting too much. And so it's up to you how much you allow in there, which is based on what you would like them to have. So prepping in advance, sort of like meal prepping, is a great idea because in that way it cuts down on the indecisiveness that you can get from a toddler or even an older child and you know exactly how much they're getting and then we also want to encourage them to have their own space where they can get if they get if they're getting a snack they need a plate they need a cup and so you want to make sure these things are also available to them and make sure that they're on hand so they can sit down and have um, the proper items the proper objects to eat from which goes into our next part, um, eating utensils, placemat, napkins. Um, these are all things that they may be using in school. And so this will be helpful because this is a routine they have already established and they already know how to use these things. So it would be great to have those on hand. Um, a water source to get a drink. That could be a water dispenser. It could be a small bottle, a small water bottle, but something that is definitely accessible to them when they feel like they're thirsty, they have that capability of getting their own drink. Um, the next one says a learning tower or a step stool to reach the counter. And you're probably wondering, you know, why do they need to reach the counter? Where? Well, the kitchen is a great place to, once again, as I said, to bond with the children, to have them help you prep snacks or even prep with dinner. Um, some classrooms, they're already learning to chop things, they're learning to spread things. And so this gives you at home another opportunity to have them help, another opportunity to promote independence. And myself being a mother of a picky eater, this is also a great way to introduce new foods to the child. And since they're helping to prepare it, they'll probably be more ready to try these new things. And so this is a great way to introduce different foods, different textures, different smells to your children. You also want to make sure that you have cleaning materials because if they're helping out in the kitchen, what's the part, what's another part of the process? The 
next part of the process is to clean once we're done. We're preparing them for life. This is all a part of practical life, things that are practical for what they'll need you know, in the future, starting now until forever. You know, we like to have, we like to prep our meal, we like to eat, but then we also have to clean. That's a part of the whole process. So we wanna make sure that we are introducing these ideals to them early and it gives them a chance to work on various skills as well. You have fine motor skills that are being introduced, gross motor skills that are being introduced. So there are so many ways that the children are developing different skills while just helping out in the kitchen. So this is a great learning opportunity for you and also a time to bond as well. We can go to the next slide, Ms. Erin. And this is just some pictures of kitchen tools. So if you look at the first picture, you might see a small chopping board. You see a small chopper. You may see, you also see a small pitcher, a objects to spoon items with. And so these are all objects that a child can work with. If you can see their child size. And so they're perfect for their hands. It also helps them to manipulate them because they're according to the size of their hands and they're not the utensils that we may use or the knives and cutting objects that we may use. I do like to also interject here that as a child gets older and they're capable of using objects that may be a little bit sharper, you can start to introduce those, not right away, but you can start to introduce those as they get older. And the idea is that you're showing them how to properly use them, including these objects. We wanna make sure we're showing them how to properly use them. And so when they're chopping things, say for instance, a banana, or an apple, they know how to hold it properly to chop those things. And as you see, we have the chopper on top of a cutting board. So once again, when we're having the children help us cooking or any in any way, we wanna make sure that we're, we're providing the necessary tools to make sure that they're successful and they are able to carry out whatever activity that we're having them to help us with. And the next picture is a picture of a learning tower. This is great because it creates a space where the child is elevated and they're elevated so that they can reach the counter, but also it's safe. You know, this, this guy, he's maybe a little bit taller, but it's also safe because um, there are sides and there's a back and a front. And so we don't have to worry about the children falling. And it looks like it may be adjustable as well. And so this is just another idea um, for our slightly older friends who love to help out in the kitchen and it gives them a better view of what you're doing and how you're preparing food and also how you're using utensils such as knives and spooning and stirring. And so this is a great thing to have in a kitchen or a ladder, a small step ladder, depending on the height of your counter, is something that you can also think to use in your kitchen as well when you're allowing a child to help you. If we can go to the next slide. Yes, Aaron. So this is our, this is the eating area. So the idea of the eating area is to have the children learn to sit while they're eating, sit at a table. And this first picture, as you can see, this is from one of the infant classrooms and it's a chair without sides. We do have chairs with sides as well, but this is a chair without sides and it's low and it allows the child to sit down easily and get up when they're done. And what I want to place emphasis on with this table is that this table is great for snack time. So if your child is eating a snack just before they're taking a nap at home, this is their place to eat. We want to make sure that we also place emphasis that we, we encourage you to not allow the children to walk around while they're eating. Um, that we encourage them to sit at a table. This is where we eat. We sit down, we sit and we eat our food. So we want to make sure that we have that space available to them and that it, in, it gives them that independence that when they are all done, they're able to get up or you know when they're going to sit, it's not a high table at a high table or a high chair where they can't get in. So then of course, if they don't have something like this available to them, they're gonna wanna walk as they're eating. So you wanna make sure that we have this area set aside specifically for them 
before their snack times. Um, one of my favorite things I love to talk about is grace and courtesy. And so that's a part of grace and courtesy. We, you know, we try to model, role model for the children how 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 do we eat? How do we sit? How do we how do we drink from a cup? How do we do all this? We do it sitting at a table. And so we want to make sure that we have this space for them. And they'll love it because it's their own table, their own chair, and it's to their size. And so they're able to manipulate, get up, sit down as they need to. This other chair, this is a stove chair because of course we wanna have this small seating area for the children for snack time. But meal times such as dinner, we wanna make sure as much as possible that we have the children sitting at the table with us. And this chair is great because it allows a child to climb up the chair and climb back down. Now, if you don't have one of these chairs, totally understand if you have a high chair, um, but what I would encourage is as much as possible having the child sitting with you at the table. And this is important because what greater role model will a child have than, of course, their classmates when they're at school, but when they're at home, you're their role model for how to eat, how to sit, and basically how to have conversation. Because when we sit and we eat, most of the time that's where we're talking about the day, how things went, or making plans. And so it's really great to see to have that child see that interaction between adults or even talking to the child about different things that went on throughout the day. And so we wanna make sure that they're sitting with us at the table and so they can see all these different interactions. And then they're also able to watch as we're picking up a spoon, as we're cutting a piece of meat or as we're taking a cup and we're drinking from the cup because they take in everything. And so when they watch us do these things, guess what? They're gonna wanna do those things as well. And so we wanna make sure that we have them close by so that we can role model these different, um, these different activities. We can go to the next slide. This is a bathroom. I'm gonna sort of combine the two um, slides about the bathrooms, but this is a picture. And this is a picture of an infant bathroom. And I know some of you may have a changing table in your bathroom and that is great, especially for the tiny ones. Um, the ones who aren't able to sit up on their own, we have um, changing tables. You can also use a changing pad in your bathroom as well. One of the things that I wanna place emphasis on is that in the bathroom that your environment is prepared. That's one thing we always talk about, the prepared environment. So you wanna make sure you have your basket for soil clothing, your garbage can, your diaper pail. Um, you wanna make sure that you have wipes, your diaper um, cream, everything is on hand so that you can make this, this activity of going to the bathroom something that is enjoyable. I know that's kind of hard to even imagine, but having the things you need in your bathroom will make this this a smoother process for you and a child. And this potty chair is great because with the potty chair, once the child is able to sit on their own without support and of course stand, this is a great um, thing to introduce them to. And you're not rushing them, but it's just something you can have in a the bathroom. They may come in and see you sitting. And so this is, you know, something that's low enough that they can do this on their own if they're um, walking. If we can go to the next slide. Ms. Aaron. And this is a bathroom for 18 to 36 months. Once again, you would have a potty chair in here. Um, you may even have a seat that's sort of like a convertible um, toilet seat you can put on top of your regular toilet for the child if they're able to reach it. Um, you wanna make sure you have a basket for soiled clothing, also options for clean clothes as well, because at this point, the child may be starting to toilet learn. And so in your bathroom that's set for them, you wanna make sure you have all of these things readily available to make their experience a success in the bathroom. You wanna make sure you have a step stool to the sink and the toilet and the tub so that the child can independently do these things, of course, with supervision, but with you watching nearby and they can do these things on their own. Um, you wanna make sure that you have a low mirror because when we go to the bathroom, of course, we wash our hands, we look in the mirror, we wanna create that same experience for the um, child. Um, you wanna make sure that you also have a low hook for a towel, you know, 
of course, right now, especially, but all the time we're promoting hand washing right now. And so you want to make sure you have a little hook for a towel that can dry their hands. And then also a small chair so that when they do have to change their clothes, they have a space where they can sit and they can comfortably do these things. And so this is a great picture to give you an idea what a bathroom can look like. And if we can go to the next one, thank you, Miss Erin. So this picture is um, the picture of an infant's bath, bath, bedroom. And if you look, this is a low bed. And so and I know my, a lot of you are probably like, wow, a low bed for an infant. But, you know, we, we do, we use cribs. We use cribs at school and once they get older, we do use low beds. And so if possible, once they're old enough, and of course, once you're comfortable, a low bed is great. Um, this room you want to make sure you have proper lighting in the room, um, a nice comfortable rocking chair. If you go in sometimes and you sit and you read with them before they're um, sleeping, you want to have books in a basket, a small chest of drawers, a mobile or pictures on the wall, um, and a white noise machine. White noise machines can be and will be your friend. And I just want to make sure, you know, want to place emphasis that this is the area where we encourage them to sleep, where we encourage them to relax. And so you don't see a whole lot going on in this room, which is perfect because at this point, we want to encourage the child to begin to wind down and they're preparing to relax and sleep. We can go to the next slide. And this is another picture of an infant bedroom and you can see the nice chair for, you know, whoever, whomever is helping the child to prepare them for sleep time. And there are a few materials you may see that are in um, inside of the little, the cubbies and the shelves. And there's a white noise machine also there and curtains that black out the sun because you wanna make sure you create that, that setting, that atmosphere that encourages sleep. We can go to the next one, Ms. Aaron. So bedroom for 18 to 36 months. So when we get to this age, um, once again, you know, a floor bed is great. Floor bed is great. It allows the child independence to go into their bed. And when they're done with resting, it allows them independence to get up from their bed as well. You want to have all of the same things you have in an infant bedroom. Um, some of the different things you might have in um, this age group's bedroom, you want to have some low rods for the child to reach in the closet. And the reason why you want to have these is that at this point, you're giving the child even more independence when doing things like choosing what they're going to wear. And so you want to have their environment set that they are given easy access to outfits. Outfits that you have already chosen, but there's a few options for them, but not too many. You don't want to overwhelm them with too many options, but just a few. And then you'll also have a basket of books, um, pictures on a wall, a lamp and a mirror. And I do want to place emphasis within this bath, this um, bedroom. You want to make sure, actually, if we can go to the next slide, Miss Erin. So this is a picture of um, an 18 to 36 month bedroom. And if you've noticed everything in this room, it's to his or her level. And so they're able to walk around the room. They're able to get books if they wanna read. They're able to sit in a nice comfy chair. And what I wanna definitely place emphasis on is that at this age group, since they're able to get up and they have more independence, you want to make sure that the room is safe, that the sockets are covered, that if there are any curtain um, strings, that you want to make sure that they're not in reach. And so at this room, definitely you want to make sure that it's childproof and that everything that is inside of this room is something that the child can use. Because if they get up in the middle of the night, which they very well, they very well may, they're able to move around the room, explore their room, because this is, once again, their environment. They are given permission to be independent in this space. It's their space. So we want to make sure that it's you know, safe for them to use. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Miss Christina. Hi. I'll try to keep these last two slides short. I know you have all been sitting in front of a screen for working from home for a while already. So for the cozy area, it's pretty simple. A lot of these items you probably already have at home or can easily find in stores. First, if you're able to have this area near a window to ensure natural lighting, what Ms. Carol was talking about earlier. Having a comfortable area rug and for sitting using bing bags or a rocking chair or a small couch, what are you deem is appropriate for your child? 
For books, you can use a basket for younger children, and for older children, you can use a, self, a shelf. Again, we want to tailor the amount of books uh, we want to keep the, in the baskets or on the shelves. One, this helps keep their attention, and two, helps to avoid overstimulation. And along with this, keeping the area uncluttered and having minimal photos on the wall, so maybe one or two. We want this area to be a place where your child can find calmness and quietness, just as we need our quiet time, so do our children. And let's say maybe you don't really have an area to create this type of environment, you can also just use a tent. Obviously, you want the tent to be something they can easily ask, access, and maybe you could just use a beanbag in there and just a basket for the books. Now we're on to how to set up your outside environments. So that could be your balcony, your deck, or your backyard, whatever you use to create outside time for your children. First, have tools that are appropriate size for your child, as we've been talking about throughout this whole presentation, and appropriate to their de de developmental level. You also want to keep in mind that you want the tools to be the ones that you actually use in your outside environment. So if you rake leaves with a rake, have a rake. If you shovel snow with a sh shovel, have a shovel. Or if you carry around dirt with a wheelbarrow, have a wheelbarrow. We are always trying to be real in the activities we do with our children. Second, have areas designated for tools. This doesn't have to be fancy, we're outside, so a little disorder is okay. An area also for water source, similar to what Ms. Vivian was talking about earlier in the kitchen area. One, you want it to be easily accessible, and two, easy for your child to manipulate. A great thing about the outdoors is that if you really can have a water disposal, you can just use a bucket full of water and just a cup as a means to retrieving water and for watering for your garden or your flowers or your grass. <laughs> also an area for putting your outside shoes or even just an area to have uh, for your child to clean their feet when they're all done being outside. So certain activities you could do with your child is one, gardening. This one, this one helps you teach your child to care for the environment outside of their home and also concrete, then concre concretely demonstrates to your child where their food comes from. Teaching concretely is important during this age since this is how our children are able to grasp and understand the world around them. Another area you can have is a sandbox. In this, you can have buckets and molds and you can also create sensory play through it. You can play toys or other items that are of interest to your child in them and give them shovels, like little shovels or brushes so they can retrieve those items. Other activities that you can do outside with your child is water painting. This is mess free. So pretty much you have a bucket with water and a paintbrush and they can use it to paint on fences or the concrete. Other things you do is creating seasonal baskets. So you could correct, co collect leaves during the fall or flowers during the spring or summer, obviously in appropriate areas. Other things you could do is uh, create balance beams using logs or anything else that is accessible to you. And let's say you don't have a lot of space or if you have a lot of space, just laying down a blanket and just nature watching. You could use a pair of binoculars to observe. Also, a lot of these activities can be brought to you to playgrounds. If that's an option for you, I know right now we're all kind of confined to what is available to us and what is safe. Now onto walks, which I think we're all utilizing to its full extent more recently. First, make sure your child's dressed for the occasion. We constantly talk about this throughout the year for every season. And as we always say, there's never bad weather, just bad clothes. Children are able to go on long walks if they're prepared. You want to leave them up for success as we've been talking about throughout this presentation. One, giving them ample time to get dressed. And two, making sure they have clothes to protect them from the elements, obviously. Uh, other things you could do on your walk is, especially if it's maybe walk time is not something you, your child looks forward to, is creating a scavenger hunt or an ice spy game or racing. Uh, this next part, this isn't necessarily an outside activity, but something that could be fun to do is taking pictures of common sites seen on your walks and creating a book out of it. It doesn't have to be anything fancy, of course. This helps uh, your child create a strong relationship between themselves and their outside environment. And it also could be a means to develop language depending on how you use it. Also for infants, 
it would be helpful to have a stroller that gives them space for movement and also lets them be able to see the world around them during your walks. Lastly, though we are talking about the outdoors, I felt that was important to talk about creating movement indoors since we're all kind of confined. In our classroom, how we encourage movements by creating, creating an oval shape with a tape on the floor. You don't have to use a tape, you can also use a rug. It also doesn't have to be any shape for, uh, specifically. In this area, we play music or sing nursery rhymes. We can do sign and says or stop and go dancing. Honestly, you could do whatever you know your child loves and excites them for this area for movement. You can also use this time to do silent games. It is very simple and be used in so many great ways. And another good thing, uh, another good thing, thing to do with these silent games is maybe using a stopwatch or a stand timer to demonstrate how long the silent game is going to be. And other ways to create movement and strengthen their growth motor skills is having them help you with groceries. Similar to what Ms. Vivian was talking about earlier, letting them be a part of your daily activities. So that for groceries, they can help you bring in the bags or even put away that gallon of milk. I know it's really big, but your children can definitely do it if you help them. You can also have them help you during laundry time, moving the basket around. And let's say you really don't have the time or the, yeah, the time to let them be a part of this activity. You can use crates and you can place safe, heavy items in these crates. And you can have your child move this around an obstacle course. You can make the obstacle course using items in your house or even tape on the floor as we had talked about previously. And also you could just create regular obstacle course. You don't need to be pushing a crate around. Our children spend so much of their time working and learning practical life skills. And yes, they have freedom of movement throughout their days, but large movements and intentional movements done through gardening, dancing, or helping around the house is such an important part of their development, not only physically, but mentally. You can really see how confident your children become when they're able to do so much of on their own outdoors. We've reached the end of the presentation. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining and being a part of the Montessori in the home. Uh, for the next slide, here are the resources that we have listed down. And I think, yeah, these are the resources we have listed down for all the items we've been talking about. Thank you so much. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to stop sharing our screen and I'm going to open up the chat box. Thanks to everyone for hanging in with, with us um, through this presentation. I don't see any messages in the chat box right now, but if you care to unmute yourself and if you have some something you'd like to learn more about, something specific you, you'd like to ask our, our team, our panel here right now, um, please feel free. Give everyone a few minutes. Any questions at all? I uh, may have missed this in the very beginning, but uh, it looks like you've been recording this session here. Yes, the, yes, I'll go ahead and reiterate that. Yes, this will is, has been recorded. I'm gonna go ahead and convert this and this will be available privately through the private YouTube channel that Mac um, has right now. There's a playlist for our CPE series that the nursery level has done this year. Um, so you can go back and check out this one or the ones that we've um, held in the past. There's a great one. Hey, you know, they, these all have a lot of common threads. So this, this really um, comes together in a lot of different ways. If you've attended more than one um, CPE in this series, you'll, you, you'll hear um, a lot of overlapping um, information, um, especially toileting and how to set up your home. Freedom with limits was touched out and we dig a little bit deeper into all of those. So we definitely encourage you to revisit those um, if it's a better time for you. Just, you, uh, yeah, thanks so much. I see a thank you from Pablo. Thank you for attending. And just for everyone who's still here, um, you know, the, um, the panel tonight mentioned some great resources. I just wanna reiterate that your classroom teacher or any, any of our nursery level teachers are more than willing to, uh, to help you brainstorm if there's an area regarding how to set up your home for Montessori um, in the Montessori style or any issue at all. We, we, you know, we share our successes and we share our vision and, and um, we're very happy to do that. So um, please reach out to the panel that spoke tonight or your classroom teacher uh, if you have any questions that arise in the future.
If that's all, I think I think we'll say good night. I think we'll say thanks so much for joining us, and and uh, we hope to see you next time. Thanks, thanks everyone. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.